Hello and welcome to No CB, a grand strategy podcast. This is episode 101 for the week of the 26th of January, 2022. I'm Lynn. I'm your host. I'm here uh, with our friends Rose. Ayo. And Father Loris. Hello. And our special guest for this week, Atlas. Hello. And uh, for... <laughs> the rosebud. <laughs> I might have to dip out for a moment that's to help fine. him that's, get ready to go outside. That's, 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 that's fine, yeah. Uh, he's having a freak out that I'm not there. <laughs> well, we'll, <laughs> we'll start off uh, just for anybody who doesn't know who you are. Atlas, what do you do and how did you get into grand strategy games? Hi, uh, so uh, my name's Atlas. Uh, I'm a generally, I do uh, EU4 streaming. Uh, that's my my primary game. Um, uh, right now I'm doing a little bit of RimWorld. We're doing like a community RimWorld playthrough with like a Twitch integration that's been a, a lot of fun. Um, got into strategy games. Uh, I generally have played uh, RTS, started with Company of Heroes, and then... Uh, found Hearts of Iron 3 a long time ago, uh, essentially spent hours, you know, building out all of the structures in Hearts of Iron 3 and then never actually hitting play. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, yeah, and then this, uh, this eventually... This is a great order of battle. I would not want to mess it up by having to actually use it, yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Um, and then eventually found uh, EU4 and just instantly clicked, and that just became the the game that resonated most with me in terms of just you know the storytelling, nation building, all all of that, uh, and that kind of captured it. And then I'll I'll dabble across all the other Paradox titles from Solaris to CK3, but always go back to my roots with EU. Yeah. What is the? I haven't actually like checked in on RimWorld in a while. What do they have in terms of Twitch integration now? Uh, it's actually pretty cool. Uh, like you, it's called the Twitch Toolkit, and essentially what you do is, um, as viewers are uh, interacting with chat and just watching the the stream, they get uh, a essentially a coin every two minutes or, or some amount of coins every two minutes, and then they can use Twitch commands um, that are built into the mod. You don't have to set anything up really. Um, and they can like buy items, buy events, good and bad, um, ah. that introduce into the colony. Like they can buy their own pawn into the colony, um, and they can do all kinds of crazy stuff. Like you, you got to be careful because sometimes, like uh, when we were testing it, one of my uh, mods did what we're calling the chicken bomb, where they introduced a thousand chickens, uh, which started reproducing uh. and literally lagged <laughs> out right. the entire game. Yeah, it was good. God, it's like cats Fantastic. into a fortress, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry, if it sounds like I'm shuffling around, it's because my dog just threw up right after we started oh, the podcast. Oh, gosh, we got a good so, start, then. Rosebud um, wakes up and a dog throws up. Yeah, uh, yeah, perfect timing on, on all Just see my stairs here. collapse, and it's um, a perfect, <laughs> perfect yeah, setup. Yeah. <laughs> okay, don't, you don't eat that, no. That's, that's why you threw up. All right, you good? All right. All right, I think I think we got it dealt with. Um, <laughs> well, part of what we had had you on is we're gonna we're gonna be talking a little bit about the grandest LAN uh, for E four later on in the show. That's gonna be our kind of main second half of the show topic. Mm -hmm. um, before we get to that, I think we're gonna talk a little bit of Victoria three. Um, we got th this was the UI dev diary. La last week was the UX dev diary. Yeah. And I'm, I'm I'm assured that these are very important distinctions in the software world. I tend to, tend to kind of think they're sort of the same thing, yeah. but some people would call me a heretic for that. Um, yeah, I think UX uh, just managed to leak its way onto like CVs and yeah. jargon, and now it's made its way into like the mainstream. I I'm, I'm too old fashioned to get used to it. I'm going to call it all UI. That's my, yeah. my stand, my last stand. It's the hill I will die right. On. UI here. Right. Um, well, uh, as as we're taking a look at this, I know you told me before the show, Atlas, that you're pretty excited about Victoria Three. Do you have anything in particular that you're excited about, or like you have like a big plan for like what your first game is going to be? Uh, yeah. Uh, so a little bit of additional background. So I I'm 
entirely fascinated with economics. Um, I'm actually applying to a couple PhD programs for economics. And oh, so, wow. yeah, Vicky three is, is like my dream game, right? <laughs> it's entirely <laughs> economics. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and so, uh, I'm really excited to see how the the market system and the the strategic diplomacy integrates in with the rest of the game. Um, and uh, I'm, that is like what is most exciting to me. And I think part of it is actually the the user interface and and making it so that you are able to make informed decisions at that strategic level, which I don't think any game, even Victoria 2, which I love, um, I don't think any game has gotten it right yet, which uh, Paradox trying to tackle that is actually pretty phenomenal. Yeah, I mean, gosh, Vicky is clunky as hell now. I, I, don't get me wrong, I do love Vicky 2's UI, and once you get used to it, it's fine, but trying to introduce new players to it, I don't know if you've ever had that experience. It's uh, it's it's always the last rung on like the, the Paradox ladder if you're introducing people to games. Vicky's right at oh, the top yeah. there. Maybe Hearts of Iron 3. Modifiers, just... no tooltips. Yeah, yeah, yeah nothing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, how do you feel about sort of... Uh, I assume you've played Victoria too, if you're mm -hmm. into economics. Uh, the way that they're kind of trying to solve all of these weird issues with like disappearing money and like mm. all the money ending up in like under somebody's bed in like Burma or something like that. Uh, with with instead of actually tracking like the quant their exact quantities of things that exist throughout the world, instead you just have kind of like a triggered, oh, there's a shortage happening. Um, if if demand and supply get enough out of sync, do you feel like that's a reasonable estimation of industrial economics? Um. So I. The big worry that I would have using that would be um, that you then have to start um, abstracting a lot more if you want to build on it. Um, what I would, uh, um, the way that I think would be a really future proofed way of building it would be to pre design all of your money faucets and your money sinks. Um, and then build it at like the entity level um, with each step in between. Uh, a really great example of this would be like EVE Online, which is another game that I absolutely love, um, which has a functioning <laughs> economy. Yeah, um, I really feel love economics. Almost too to be. well functioning. <laughs> too well functioning. My, sure. my, uh, my, my friends back in the day used to call it spreadsheet commando. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> Absolutely. As my dad put it, he stopped playing because it felt too much like the real world. <laughs> no, it's, I, I call it, it's my favorite game that I don't play. I yeah. don't really have any interest in playing it, but I think it's fascinating and I love hearing about stuff other people did in you. Yeah, yeah all the great stories of the m hundreds of thousands of dollars lost in a single battle. And yeah. All oh, that. yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I kind of the way I would, if I, if I, which again, saying it is very different from implementing it. So you got to give credit to <laughs> right. Paradox. To, yeah. Um, the way I would think about doing it is pre-setting what your, what your extraction mechanisms are, uh, i.e. pops and uh, what I would say in the long run corporations, which I think would be a really cool, like DLC down the road. Oh um, yeah. Yeah. And, and essentially the way it would, the way I think like a really robust world market would look is you essentially have all of your inputs, which are your state level, you know, lumber yards, just like in Vicky 2, all of the, the what were they called? Um, RGOs. RGOs, yeah. 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 Um, so yeah, all of like the top line would be your RGOs. And then at the very bottom, which is extracting all of the, the money from the game are actually pops, which are consuming the goods, yeah. as well as like the countries, which are acting as entities. Um, and then... In the middle are all the markets, which I, I would say were, would be like regional. And so the entities interact with the, the markets regionally, mm. and then all of the RGOs input into the markets regionally. And if you can control those sinks and faucets, then down the line, you can do a lot with uh, where you don't have to abstract as much. And when you do want to abstract, you very easily can. Um, but again, that that's 
a once over the world. And the implementation of that is a hundred times more complex than how I'm describing it. So, yeah, yeah man, I, I really want to get Martin on to talk about uh, the economic system yeah, in Victoria same. 3. I know he's every time I ask Troy is like, oh, he's he's super busy, he's super busy. <laughs> so it might it might be a while, but he's like the one developer that we haven't had on the show yet that I really, really want to get on. Show it. Yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, I think when we're yeah. further along in the development cycle of Vicky, we'll probably be able to do it. Yeah, I hope so. Uh, Maybe after they finally announce a date. Because he's also <laughs> just one of those developers that is really excited to talk about what he's working on. So <laughs> he's always really fun to interview. Uh, uh, I don't know. I don't know how he kept Victoria Three a secret as long as he did. He must have died. And, he's probably just cackling yeah. over it to himself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Laura says, uh, I know you always joke when I throw it to you as our resident artist, <laughs> but what, what do you think of, uh, like the, the UI stuff we got in this? Yeah, it's pretty, I, I don't know what else to say about yeah. it. Uh, we good icons. <laughs> it's, yeah, um, they're very readable. I think that's the right amount of detail. It seems like, I mean, it's been said about the artistic direction of, of it quite a lot. It, it looks like Anno 1800 so much. <laughs> like, oh yeah. Even the icons look very, very similar. Um, especially when, remember when the trailer popped, it was like, is this is this the Anno expansion? Oh, it's Vicky, I see. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, the art looks gorgeous. Um, can't, I can't fault yeah. it. Um, I'm still not, I'm uh, so unsure about the, the Occupy map thing still. Um, yeah, so yeah, a, it looks better. It looks better than it has previously, I think, in this Is that just because it's the Brazilian but... flag and it's green on green? It's a bit more subtle. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good flag. Yeah. Um, I'm also, like, I'm a little bit wary about the, they show these lens icons and there's only five of them. It's like, I want, I want my 10 million map modes. I know it's overwhelming for new players, but like, I've just gotten so used to it with yeah. the U4. To be well, able to overlay a... anything I can think of on the map that I I want my 10 million yeah. map modes. You know what could, like, if it was only, you know, like four or five were visible, I guess. Mm. But then you could set more of them. Like yeah. you could in mm. CK2 and EU4. It'd be nice yeah. if it was like just in an options. Because if I understand the dilemma they've got, especially in a lot of the modern games, like CK3, I think it's got a problem with lack of map modes big time. Um, yeah, CK3 definitely needs more. And I understand, oh, yeah. like, like <laughs> trying the, to figure out duchies and everything. Yeah. So it's, it's a nightmare. We need more. Always more. All the map modes in CK3. Yeah, we need a region but... map mode. We need a language map mode now. We need a heritage map mode now. Like, those are all separate things from culture. So, like... but, but I understand, like, yeah. the, the dilemma they got, right? They don't want to put off new players by having data information overload, but right? You know what could work with, like, CK3, for example? Yeah. Is I forgot. There's like what five, six. I can't remember off the top of my head. There's let's like say, five let's main say there's and like four or five like extra ones that you can find. Yeah, let's say yeah. there's five, and then under that you have a slot for three more that you can select which ones. Yeah. I'll just have yeah. So let's say language is really important to you in this playthrough, so you put it there. But it's another one you don't care about language, so you put duchies. Yeah. I'll just put it in the options. Like have a tick box saying advanced advanced map modes on and then it yeah. That's true. That allows it. Because if it, if your worry is that people would first join the game and go, Oh my goodness, this is too much, I'm overwhelmed. Then if it's hidden behind well, an option that menu, was that's that's a common problem with CK two and EU four. Yeah, exactly. And I yeah. understand why they, they don't want to have the upfront information. Have it in the options. So like when you go into a game and you're more comfortable with it and you're looking through the options, you go, hold on, what's this? Advanced map modes? Gonna click that on. Bang, I I've opened up so much more information. Now I'm comfortable at the game. I feel like yeah. that's oh. a that's a healthy way of doing it, but I, I, I would be very much against like always limiting my map modes on the basis yeah. that it's gonna well, be and, too and, much for new players. You know, with Vicky three, I'm gonna want I'm gonna want standard of living. I'm gonna want like GDP per state. I'm gonna want yeah. market access, infrastructure, like just population, raw population. I want a lot of map modes. <laughs> There's a lot of map modes. I'm gonna I'm gonna want. Yeah. So, yeah, and I would love for yeah. them to just take the EU4 methodology with being able to hotkey it to the 10 panels and being able yep. to overlay on the hotkeys. Yeah, yeah. That setup is perfect. When, I, when I'm playing EU4 and I need to cycle, like I, you, every player as you're building it, you can, you can essentially, you know, 
tie three different map modes to your Q key. And very quickly, you know that like one hit of Q, two hit of Q, three hit of Q, and you can yep. build your own way of communicating to yourself rapidly. And I, that is actually one thing that I wish they did for CK3 instead of just like kind of limiting you to what yeah. exists. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, I fully agree. I understand why they did it. Like I said before, like it's, oh, yeah. it's yeah, but like I don't know. For advanced if you're, players, if you're playing Vicky, yeah, if, you, yeah. <laughs> if you're a Paradox fan, yeah, you want uh-huh. yeah more info, right? Like yeah, detailed think, demographic info. Yes. So I hope it's... they, I hope they do have. Yeah, you're right. What's that? How many lenses there? Maybe yeah. Yeah, like more lenses info. is what they're calling map modes. I assume. Right. Five. Yeah. Speaking more info, we do have a teaser from Martin about uh, Santa Ana now having more roles. Yeah, which this is good because I think earlier in one of the earlier dev, one of the comments they mentioned that like they were trying to get this working, but they hadn't yet. Hmm. Where someone can be a political leader and a military leader at the same time, and the game recognizes that it's the same person. Um. So I'm glad they got it working because yeah, that's kind of this is only yeah. historically accurate. So and uh, <laughs> it looks like he has a unique. Um, how would you pronounce that? Caudismo is that close? I'm not trying. <laughs> I don't know. I don't um, attempt it. I'm not this, Spanish. Uh, we'll speak Spanish. It's here. like well, it's it's a it's it's a Spanish concept that's basically like rule by by strong men is essentially what it is so um i'm i'm hoping that there's lots of those where it's like a culturally specific thing where it might be a little bit you know us a, a latin american you know strong man type figure might be different from you know caudalismo is what YouTube is telling me here. Caudalismo is how we say it. I'm pretty sure that's wrong because the double L always um, makes a Y sound in Spanish, is to my knowledge. Uh, but yeah, I, unless somebody's Spanish in chat, I don't know. Caudalismo, uh, because it's Welsh, double L. Oh, yeah, it's definitely, yeah, it's derived from the Welsh. Yeah, yeah. I think so. If you're um, Caudalismo? Caudalismo? That's how I would guess. Pronounced, uh-huh. but yeah I, again i i took spanish for like three years in elementary school and i've forgotten everything except how to say the names <laughs> of some, veg- some vegetables and animals so when else not um, says yes yeah. i mean i, I honestly took... think yeah i honestly i had think it's spanish for nine weeks or six weeks i don't know it was yeah. one quarter I no i honestly think it's silly like, anything, like... So don't worry Large, large parts of the United States were Spanish speaking before there were any English people here. And it's it's kind of the second language of the United States and we should all have to learn. But uh, <laughs> that's just not how it works. at this point. <laughs> um, hmm. Yeah. So uh, we do you know how modding works for CK3? We do. Um, this is once every every time they talk about modding with CK3, they kind of go above and beyond what i would expect <laughs> like it's just a so such a moddable game like the idea that you can yeah. actually position people and artifacts and like create new spots for artifacts in the royal court is way well, more than i would have ever imagined the amount of like modability to be yeah uh, i mean uh, even beyond that we have same-sex marriage now as moddable yeah I, I think it wasn't right. originally, wasn't it? Or was it? Is that no, I think it, it was, wasn't. Oh. I think it was moddable, and now it's. There's actually a game rule for it where you don't need a mod to turn. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the there's, a, there's a game right. rule, but I think modded. It was like a really weird workaround. Like remember what Agame did for the murdering of the babies for multiplayer chat. <laughs> oh yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. Really? yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I think it was a pretty weird workaround from what okay. someone was saying. Yeah, um, it's still, I, I still think you need, like, good adoption mechanics to make this fully, like, a fully fleshed out feature. Because yes. if, if you're just allowed to get married to someone of the same sex, but you can't carry on your dynasty. Even if it just works with know. something like it does in, uh, like, The Sims, where, oh, we adopt, and just a baby magically appears. Yeah, or I guess yeah. if, you're, if your religion has polygamy, you. you could have, like... Your main spouse, who is like your your you know same your sex lover, life. 
And then you have like some additional spouses who are just there to be like, we need to have kids because otherwise. Oh, I mean, yeah, yeah. the dynasty is right? going to die out. So, yeah, you have your main spouse who's the love of your life, your partner, yeah. and everything. They have all the power. And they then have you have some stats. concubines that are just there yeah. to help provide an heir to the throne. Yeah. I can see that. You would still be able to maintain like the the hereditary mechanics that I think is really cool about CK3, mm -hmm. right? Like the first thing yeah. I always do when I play a CK3 campaign is I always try to find the most uh genius uh attractive uh, what's the third um uh beautiful? The, yeah, the beautiful, beautiful. genius. Be uh, hey, um, I think what yeah, there's the hail? strong, the strong, strong. Yeah, yeah, strong, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, strong. That, that yeah, line. Yeah. Just but then there's the extra one, one, the fecund, where yeah, they're just very the good at making babies. <laughs> yeah, the it rabbit. also gives you a small health boost, though. So I've, I've, I've been able to make a character in the character designer who lived to be 121 years old. If you don't play with achievements on, so yeah, if you if you stack modifiers, they can get up there. Um, yeah. 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 Oh, I always uh, just go for an albino dynasty. Doing it. Yeah. <laughs> we have Kazi in chat saying, Concubines, just there to provide an heir to the throne and stab your main spouse repeatedly in an attempt to get ahead. Source, <laughs> basically every real harem ever. I mean, the Ottoman harem actually worked a little differently. Oh, yeah. Like, they deliberately tried to just put random women in there had so many of them and the only way to like move up from a servant to a concubine essentially was you slept with the emperor or the sultan and then from uh to actually become like like real power you had to give birth to a boy hmm. and a lot yeah. of these women only slept with the sultan like once because <laughs> so they had so many here's here's what i would like to see because honestly CK3 has done a fantastic job with this so far. Like, we, we told them to please make it a priority, and they did, and they implemented it, and now it's, like, not, like, you don't even need mods anymore, like, with this patch. You can just turn on a game rule for it. Mm -hmm. What I would still like to see is, okay, so let's say that situation we described before happened, where mm -hmm. you have, like, a same-sex spouse who's your main spouse, and they're helping you run the kingdom and stuff. And then you have some concubines or secondary spouses, depending on what your, your culture like, rules are. Yeah, culture and religion. Uh, when they have kids, it would be cool if your main spouse would like accept that those are your like kids could... together. Like they're not going to want to kill them or something. <laughs> like, yeah, especially. That can happen. Yeah. Especially, or even if they picked like yeah. a favorite or two favorites. Like let's oh, say yeah. you had six kids. And they really fell in love with the third and the sixth one, and they support those two to become to get on the throne. And they'll yeah. try and kill the other kids, but they want to keep those two kids alive. And it could it could be a it could be like a cultural pillar or something that's like uh, you know communal family where it's like the primary spouse will always get a parent child relationship modifier with the children of their spouse or oh. what, even if it's with a different person or something like Speaking that. Speaking of which, that would be, that'd be, that'd be really cool to have a, a, a court position of favorites, like, like Piers Gaveston or something, you know, something that did historically happen. <laughs> have a court favorite. Yeah. This, that probably, a, probably would uh... piss off the rest of your court, which did historically oh, yeah. happen also. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. Who's this, this guy is, this who keeps going... like, passing all, this, all these laws who <laughs> spends the night with the king? What's up with that? The... This um, is going into different territory, but there's a romance author called Megan Durr who primarily does um, male male romances. She also does female female, but she also has some hetero. Uh, but she created this whole world where the royalty, like let's, it's a sultan, Mary, he has a wife, but each, both the sultan and the sultana, sultana, whatever sultana. the wife's called, Sult <laughs> sultana, they both have a harem. But to keep the bloodline pure, the harem is the same gender as the spouse. Oh, okay. So, like, he has, like, five, six, I don't know, male concubines. And then is still supposed to, you know, have, have babies with his wife. Like and she has the same. It's like Frederick the Great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, works for me. Yeah, yeah. that's... 
Sounds, I mean, that, uh, that could be a part of, I mean, eventually they're going to do some type of, you know, uh, Middle East Jerusalem DLC that expands right. the Crusades. And yeah. I mean, yeah. introducing uh, a literal harem position in court. I mean, that's easy for them to actually integrate yeah. into it and then mm-hmm. to be able to allow for for the same sex stuff. You, I think the cultural way of doing it makes sense where you still have, you know, historically at that time that would be very taboo but you can work it into culture to allow for it for players who actually want to take yeah. advantage so, of that. I, think I think work it into like... a culture but maybe have it has your religion has to at least like ignore same sex not prohibit or something yeah so, like, yeah it has to they align have to both correctly. line up yeah yeah because yeah. i forgot what it is but i think right now it's uh like they they don't like it they don't care or they do like it. Yeah. And maybe it has yeah. to be uh don't care or do like it. Well they'll they'll have mm. to add like harem mechanics by the point where they're adding China at some point, right? Because there's a whole oh, text yeah. of a map yeah. which is so obvious. I mean is that right. or something that's in the game files of China existing on there. Yeah. I, I'd be <laughs> curious to see if they could actually figure out for China and for like the Islamic uh Sultanates. I wonder I, if they I, added I, China. If they'd add a thing where someone approached you and said, "Here, here is my ten-year-old son. He's a eunuch. He'd be great for yeah, the yeah. court." I mean, he's not a eunuch, really. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's, well, or uh, you know, they... nine times out of ten, he is a eunuch. Yeah. And then the tenth time, <laughs> you get <laughs> somebody who's not a eunuch. Yeah. <laughs> so what? So uh, happens to have a kid who with the that uh, actually that happens a lot. There was it? a Chinese empress who. Uh, her son was trying to keep her happy or out of his way or something because she was trying to control him. Yeah. He presented her with a new eunuch who wasn't really a eunuch, <laughs> uh, just to keep her busy. Well, famously, the famously the first emperor of China's mother uh, had a eunuch lover. Um, he wasn't a eunuch, uh, but it didn't turn out well for them. Uh, spoilers, but like, yeah, but, <laughs> you know, it was it was a very common thing. Um, Um, yeah, speaking of, I don't know, speaking of nothing, I guess, unity or something, so, Stellaris. Ascensions, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. betas, and more. Yeah, yeah, so it's just more of a unity yeah. rework. Oh, wait, 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 we have to take a step back. There was the console release date for CK3 announced. Oh, right. Oh, that's what it was. I was trying to figure out what that was about because I think I already knew the release date. Yeah, March 29th. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. do they say what patch they're starting on? Because I remember with Stellaris, they started on like a really old patch initially. For the I console don't... release. No, I mean, C- but I mean. CK3 only has like four patches <laughs> so far. <laughs> do you guys play console no. for any of the. I can't I, imagine. I, no, I no, reviewed. Uh, I reviewed the console version of Stellaris, and it's actually pretty good. Um, you're yes. limited. You're limited to only six hundred stars, so you can't play on a thousand stars uh, like you can on PC. And even on six hundred, the performance was kind of iffy. Um, but I thought that the the controls were surprisingly good. Like mm. I didn't really have that much trouble, you know, managing my empire. Burn. Yeah, the, the so. only interest for, would be for the Switch, but I don't think it's even on the Switch, is it? Because having a portable thing seems interesting, but I don't think it's just releasing on the Switch, is it? I don't think it's powerful I enough. So. I don't think this. I don't think the Switch could even run like Victoria Two. Oh, no. I don't think the Switch could run old Paradox <laughs> no, games. No, was, like, like I remember the what's it called, the City Skylines release of the Switch was apparently pretty yeah. crap. Because yeah, it's, it's only so, coming to PlayStation yeah. and Xbox for CK3. Paradox games are so CPU dependent, and the Switch just the CPU on the Switch is not that great. They're still um, just remaking Super Mario Bros. from the Super Nintendo. <laughs> so. I kind of want Stardew. I want to kind of want to switch just so I have Stardew Valley. <laughs> I rebought Stardew. I rebought Stardew on the Switch. It's a perfect Switch game. Um, yeah, that's yeah, that's what I would do. Or the chocolate game that he's working on. Yeah, yeah like yeah. I had 150 hours in Stardew on PC, and I started over, and now I have like 200 on Switch, Switch. or something like that. So, mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Stellaris, uh, they're adding something called Planetary Ascension Tiers, which is like a new way to play Tall. 
Yeah. Which would be definitely nice in the multiplayer game I'm currently in because I made an empire that was entirely based around fast expansion and then I got boxed in like in less than 100 years. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, it still that doesn't happens. have building slots. I, they, they seem really married to the current number of building slots, but it it buffs your planetary designation modifiers. So your administrative centers will be more administrative. And your forge worlds will have more forges. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's cool. Uh, <laughs> it kind of seems similar to me to uh, what was the thing they added at EU4 where you can basically uh, expand infrastructure, I think it's called. Oh, the most useless button in the world? Yeah, which yeah, I hardly ever use. Yeah, yeah, same. <laughs> This might be a little bit more useful than that because you don't really have much to do with Unity once you're you've unlocked everything. But uh, yeah, expand infrastructure was like the greatest idea that like when they decided to pick the final values it was just completely yeah, out of whack. To spend right. I, what is it a hundred governing capacity? Yeah. I, I can't remember what it is. <laughs> yeah, but, it's like, a lot. Just to build one extra manufactory, like you give up a <laughs> tier, the equivalent of a tier two reform mm -hmm. uh, or a tier three reform. Yeah. To be able to build one extra manufactory after like 1600 yeah. is, is just crazy. And at, at that point yeah. where you actually have governing capacity, A, you're, you're probably wanting governing capacity and dumping it into that. Or, I um, mean, the, like, it just doesn't matter having one extra manufacturer in a town. It's just completely, completely useless. If, yeah. you're, if you're playing on like a really strict self imposed challenge, like I'm not going to expand past a certain number of provinces, it can be useful, which I kind of think that's maybe what it's for because like if you're playing challenge. super yeah if you're playing super tall you don't have anything to do with all that governing capacity in the late game because you have enough from tech that even if you've been debbing the crap out of all of your provinces you probably are never gonna I go mean, over but. taking this back to Stellaris we do have yeah. zombies now Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's like the coolest part of the dev diary. And y'all are just like, let's jump to EU4. Oh, yeah. It's a new civic. <laughs> or, uh, mega corpse. Let's forget the zombies. Um, yeah, I, I have some ideas <laughs> on what to do with this. Um, but I'm not going to spoil it. Because I, I, if my if my multiplayer <laughs> group is listening to this, I don't want them to know what I'm going to do. <laughs> um but I, I have I have a very interesting idea of what to do with Civic. Well, you'll have um, to tell us after you try it out. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah, basically you get permanent employment and uh, reassigners turn consumer goods into food or minerals. And um, yeah, and then they turn them into people. Yeah. <laughs> Zombies. I, I don't know how useful yeah. this is, but... Uh... I mean, it's free slave labor, I guess. Yeah, but, you know, you, you're basically making a shit pop, aren't you? Pops look bad. We've got like minus twenty percent of all output. Well, yeah, more less resources, but pop up keep reduced by a hundred percent. Yeah, but now here's the here's it, the big the way question. pop growth yeah. works. It curves down like so. If you're if you're topping up your your population with shit pops, you're gonna cap out, and you know a certain percentage of your pops are gonna be crap. So well, except you don't want that really. Well, let's say you've got a really wide empire. Hmm. You need lots of pops. Yeah, but. And nothing says you could like somehow get rid of your zombies later. Yeah, if you could, yeah, getting rid of them later on and replacing them with better pops is probably a good thing, right? Like, yeah. here's here's the other th question I have: is can you genetically modify zombies? Yeah, yeah, because that opens up that some cool. some real possibilities. Definitely, yeah. <laughs> Um. Yeah. Some so, uh, back for blood vibes, getting specialized zombies. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that would be oh, cool. and also starting this Monday, there's the Dev Clash starting again. Of course, oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So the first Dev Clash we've had in years, actually, right? Uh, Dev Clash for yeah. a long time. It's been a while because I mean, I think they kind of stopped when you know the global pepperoni hit. They stopped before then, I think. <laughs> right? I mean, like, it's been... well, yeah, they usually did the Solaris one in like the spring. Yeah. So it, it's been since like 2019, because they probably had one planned for 2020. Have and I had then, one since Bjorn? Uh, sorry, since uh, Blondie left. I don't think so. Oh, that was a while I think ago. they had one in 2019, though. I'm pretty sure of it. I know they had one for Imperator. Uh, once again, time is fake, and all of the last <laughs> three years just blends together for me. 
So well, yeah. It, the only way I'm keeping IRL. track of it is <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. two years it's Two Day. years ago at this time, I was, you know, didn't have a kid. Now I've got someone outside the door going, mama, mama. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> you probably have an easier time keeping track of it for, for that reason. Um, yeah. Just have uh, Grand Slambo, I guess. Check out that. Yes. And we'll yeah. give a little bit of a dev diary first. Oh, right. Nice. Yeah, yeah. So the uh, U4 this week is talking about how they're making the AI dumb, which is always good. Mm -hmm. Um, These fourths seem excessive, but I think they acknowledge that in the dev diary. Uh, That's it's not really efficient. You could you could lose about three of three or four of those and have basically the same uh, effect, but. yeah, uh, AI is supposed to be better at budgeting now. Um, they I never didn't see bad that... budgeting to begin with, to be honest. Like, the, the AI, I don't know. The problems with the AI I see of a unit, the way they move their units um, seems to be pretty dumb <laughs> to me. Oh, um, yeah. It always has been. Yeah. yeah. We have Agma Day in chat saying the audio cut out, so it sounds like they are making AI dumb. Which is honestly what I thought sounded like you guys said. <laughs> yeah, they're they're making them less dumb. Uh, I, I assume that the AI will always seem somewhat dumb. Because yeah, because it's AI. We're humans, be, yeah. and we have big brains, and we can we're smarter than a robot. Innovate. So, we can innovate. Big yeah. face yeah. <laughs> Except for other lords. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I like almost all of the changes that I read here, except that it sounds like they're going to make more the AI use colonists more, which I already have thrown a fit about on the forums multiple times. I think colonization needs to be significantly yeah. slowed down. We talked about that extensively uh, last week. I've still got yeah, we talked about it a lot last week. <laughs> so, Portugal's about to be in Indonesia by 1445. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Africa's really colonized. Yeah, Asia never gets touched. So it's always... Yeah. It's yeah. They did say they saw Portugal conquer most of India in one of the... Uh, did they? Night. Okay. Yeah, uh, one of the overnight... Um, Okay. Hands off games. Though, I could make so. that more frequent. That would be great. <laughs> yeah. I like what Hercules has said here. The thing EU4 needs to do is to pause work on EU4 and start work on EU5. Yeah. I mean, that's <laughs> going to become our motto, basically. Yes. Yeah, just... Now that we've gotten CK3 I, I and yeah. way, Big E3, honest. we need EU5. I don't mind. Like, so, I, I'd be happy with more EU4, but uh, if I were something so EU5, I won't be. <laughs> I do think they kind of buried the lead in this dev diary, uh-huh. though. Um, the changes to land combat are actually huge, by the way. For for anybody who's like really interested in like land combat mechanics, uh, oh, and there's one. Uh, uh, I guess before going into land combat, um, there's a funny. I think this will fix it. But there's a oh. funny phenomenon um, with Yolof. Uh, for anybody who's trying to take advantage of uh, the new like West African changes, um, I, I've a lot of uh, viewers in my community and myself have tried to subjugate Yolof in order to get a, a vassal that can conquer all of West Africa. Uh, but we found that Yolof will not hire a military advisor, which means you can't convince Yolof to actually uh, use their own mission tree if they're your vassal, because oh, the no. first <laughs> mission in the Yolof mission tree is 100% um, hundred percent force limit and has a military advisor. But uh, so I subjugated Yolof, tried subsidized, tried to capture land for them, and they just wouldn't hire a military advisor. And so I essentially ended up having just to integrate them and then just conquer it all myself. And I'm hoping that these changes makes it so that you can actually take advantage of like the new mission trees if you're a player trying to go for a world conquest and, and take advantage of that. So, um. But yeah, and then and then the the land combat is actually insane. Yeah, um, I, no, you're completely right. They buried the lead completely here. I, I was leafing through this earlier today, and I was like, ah, oh, you know, these sound interesting, but oh, this has got completely changed the matter of like reinforcing and where you're positioning your artillery, everything. And then, here's yeah. here's like here's my question. I like the idea that you don't need to have full combat width of artillery on the first day of the battle, or you're going to 
for sure lose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But is this going to require me to just spend way more money on, like, I'm going to need to bring way more artillery total than I did before? Y yes. I, so I think this will mm -hmm. have two two effects. I think what it will mean is that the the army or the player that has the full back row of artillery isn't just going to always win the battle. Um, and that there will be some actual trade-offs over whether more infantry or, cal or artillery is actually the better play because the upkeep cost and the initial investment on artillery is so much higher than the cost for infantry. So it may actually end up being the case that if you're something like a Russia with Streltsy and you just have you know bodies on bodies to throw at a battle... You could actually overcome the ca the artillery advantage of you know maybe a Spain or something like that. Yeah, so yeah. I think it actually levels the playing field for infantry sec centric uh, okay. nations. Yeah, I mean, like it's not like uh, Russia is hurting for artillery either, mind right? It's like, <laughs> this is true, uh, true. Up buff yeah. of buff of of, uh, of Russia in general. Not that Russia needs a buff. Russia's already immensely powerful in multiplayer. Yeah, I'm still waiting to see the cavalry, of... hoping for cavalry to be able to move along the front line. Yeah, 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 that would be good because uh, the wasted flank potential is always silly. Right. Hmm. I mean, it won't change the fact that you do need to micromanage your reinforcements quite a lot. Mm -hmm. Maybe more so now, yeah, actually. Yeah, I think more, much more. Does this change at all, like, when it makes sense to start using artillery? Like, what, would you wait till a later tech level, as long as you have enough infantry to, you know, make up the difference? Well, my philosophy, um, I don't know if you agree with this, too, this, is as soon as you can afford artillery, you should start using artillery. Because even if you... It's always a nice... I was, I was always fire. told, like, until you get the limber, just don't bother. <laughs> yeah, Miltech Mil 13, I believe. Yeah. Um, so there's a couple there's a couple my my normal strategy especially in single player where you can kind of predict what the ai is going to do is to just do a um whatever the in, whatever the ai has as their frontline combat with if they have like a 20 stack yep. you then just do that much infantry with four cavalry on the side um and then your cannons if you can afford it you fill your backline with cannons if possible but generally you're going for like Five cannons in an army just for the siege, the siege on the yeah. capital for a level mm, one yeah, fort. Yeah. Um, unless you're Spain. If you're Spain, you should always just have uh, cannons from the start. If you can afford a cannon in Spain, because Spain is the only country in the game that gets a plus one to their cannon pip fire, means that um, Spain actually starts out with cannons that are twice as powerful of, as every other country in the game. Yeah. Oh, I did not know that. <laughs> uh, no, I think there's a Russian miner, but obviously no one. Like that, I think it also gets the, the cannon pip, I believe. Oh, uh, yep, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Uh, obviously, they die pretty quickly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unless you're playing them. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, how do you think? Uh, how do you think these changes would have how would have uh, changed how the grandest land played? Ooh. Um, <laughs> you should re see. should remind us who you played first. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Uh, so uh, myself and, and two others, one who's a streamer, Realms Deep, uh, uh, we played as, we started as Novgorod um, as part of the the Traders League, uh, and then we eventually formed uh, Russia. And between days, so on day one, we managed to form Russia at the very end of the the session. And between days, we actually talked to the. Um, the admins of the event and we actually asked to switch to the monarchist league because we were now russia and you awesome. know in our own storytelling <laughs> yeah we just figured it would be kind of funny to you know now we have a, a king on the throne we're no longer novgorod so we should probably join the monarchist league yeah, yeah. um and uh yeah uh that was a lot of fun because we got attacked almost every war we fought was actually a defensive war because i just like historically, everybody is worried about Russia. And so we were <laughs> usually getting no CB'd by random people. Yes. That, um, I think I remember that happening a number of times. Yeah. Yeah. It's quite and odd. And you guys one. marched troops a number of times all the way down to Egypt. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. We, uh, so actually, that uh, on 
on day two, especially near the end, we were just looking for as many fights as we could because the event was almost over. So we were ready just to throw Russian Russian troops at, at every theater of war, uh, which was a lot of fun. That, honestly, if, if anybody's ever playing a multiplayer and you get the chance to play Russia, you pretty much have unlimited manpower yep. and you can just... <laughs> Bro bodies at the problem. It's, and it's uh, Russia is so powerful. It's crazy. You, you, it's a yeah. combination of like you have basically Judge Dredge missionaries if you take religious ideas and you just like, bang. <laughs> yeah. You, you, look, at, you yep. look at a Catholic and he, yeah. and he instantly yeah. wilts towards the great patriarch. And then, um, yep. and also you've got great development thing, although that got nerfed, I believe, um, with the Cossacks. Mm. Um, development cost reductions in steps, which is amazing. And like you said, immense manpower reserves both from the Cossacks uh, and also you can just pull strats up your, from your ass really can't you it's like bang I've got a million troops <laughs> yeah, will be I, love, I love Streltsy that's I love Streltsy so much yeah well, you guys funniest... just sat on money too from what I remember because remember we discussed that a lot more Jordan and I yeah we okay so it was a little bit we, we felt we had to um, so Early on, we expected uh, the Livonian Order to declare on us. Um, when we were doing the pregame, so I was the diplomat of our team. Um, so I was usually trying to, to wheel and deal. We had uh, Squazzle, who was actually doing the management, and then Realms Deep, who was looking at it from a strategic standpoint and essentially like giving us... because. I don't for anybody who has seen a Realms Deep stream, he's one of I, I would say one of the top EU4 players uh out there in terms of his game knowledge and just skill. Yeah. Um and so he was essentially uh just planning everything out and and helping Squazzle with managing the country. And uh to have a decisive win, we very regularly knew we would have to go very high over our force limit so that uh, as Russia, we could spread out across a front and overwhelm them uh, because in a protracted war, we would lose battles um, if we if we just kept throwing bodies at the problem in individual fights. <laughs> And so, that sounds like historical Russia. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so our whole plan was to widen the front as as wide as possible um, so that we could push along the entire front so that something like a Prussia, which wants, you know, individual battles that they can just stack wipe on, couldn't couldn't maintain a front that that wide. And so we had to always have a very large war chest so that we could probably go, you know, 30 regiments over our force limit in order to, to oh, widen wow. the fence out as much as possible. Yeah. <laughs> I'm always, I'm afraid of even going one regiment over my force limit. Yeah. I'm just that kind of. Player. Well, yeah, well, I, I, if you saw our first battle, I, I even early on, I think we were 10, re, 10 regiments over our force limit just to beat the, the Livonian order. And then, uh, rise on, declared a no CB war against us pulling in Muscovy in the middle of that war. And so then we had to fight the AI Muscovy and Ryazan yeah. um, in a defensive war in order to hold on to what we got from Livonia. So that, yeah, that was spicy for sure. <laughs> yeah. I haven't played in a big EU4 multiplayer in a long time. I, I miss, we used to have a, a group with uh, some other journalists and, uh, some of the three moves ahead patrons, but man, it's like it's like running a and d game as an adult, like to get the same people back every week at the Golden same time. Sessions. Yeah, it's so difficult. To, yeah, I think I think just like D&D, um, you have to make sure that every player who's playing the game is on the same page for the experience they want. Yeah. Right, um, right. You might have some new players that want to do something a little more role play uh, or a little yeah. less, uh, you know, win everything. And then you have the players that are just, you know, multiplayer meta. I'm going to, you know, bankrupt myself because I know the game's mechanics and yep. I'm just going to, yeah. And if you have those two types of players in the same the game, then, yeah. Someone's it, not going to have fun. Right. Yep. yep. Yeah, we ran into that issue with one of the CK or CK3 multiplayer games I was in, I think, where basically... We all we started too close together, I think, and basically the the more experienced players blocked off the less experienced players from really being able to expand because mm -hmm. we were just blobbing everywhere and like we never conquered them or anything, but it's like 
they had a player on all sides that they couldn't beat. And, you know, I think it might make more sense if we do that type of game again to, like, say, okay, everybody has a region. Like, maybe one du jour empire that's, like, that's kind of set aside for you, and then we can have little border wars and stuff or something. What mm-hmm. yeah, I had to do when yeah. running multiplayer games for my uh, subscribers and stuff back when I, you know, had more time to stream. <laughs> Well, yeah. we had rules such as, uh, like alliances could only be three players. You couldn't yeah. have a fourth player, or maybe be four players yeah. depending on how many people play. So you or couldn't have everyone wars. gang up on one person. Yeah, war mm. chaining where you have you know three different players declare on the same player for mm-hmm. three separate wars, yeah. and then they just you know they have to give in to three one hundred percent war scores, and so their whole country disappears in a single single war yep. essentially. Mm-hmm. Yeah, limits There's of that. A lot of, um, lot of exploits that the experienced also, MP players will do. <laughs> also, limits on wars that could eliminate a player were not allowed before. Like, uh, I think it was fifteen fifty or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, I, I love just the merc changes because yeah. that prevented it. Because the yeah. old meta for anybody for anybody who played the multiplayer with the old mercenaries. You would essentially just bankrupt your country using mercenaries, and you would just throw them at. And now you really can't, which yeah. I think is actually a great change. Yeah, same. Mm-hmm. I, I, sometimes you get people who play multiplayer and complain about the new mercenary camps. I don't quite understand. That. I think it's it's massively improved like multiplayer gameplay. They just wanna they just wanna feel good about yet beating <laughs> some new multi. I, yeah. I don't know. There's that's what I, I think never, too. Yeah. Yeah. My I mean my philo- whole philosophy with multiplayer is like I'm never. I'm never going to take someone's last province. Like, I mean, I guess if it was like a competitive thing where we all had a goal, that would be different. But it's like, I'm at least going to keep you around as like a personal union partner or a vassal or something. Actually, like, uh, a really yeah. interesting thing. Mordred Viking ran a multiplayer game. And one day he had me sit in to host because something came up with work or whatever. Yeah. But everyone had a secret goal for their nation. Uh huh. Yeah, I love and that. no one yeah. knew what the other person's gold was. And some That's of those really goals cool. conflicted with other people's, but no one knew. And so you had people that were like working together for a hundred years, yeah, towards the towards their own goals, and then they realized that their goals did not match. Mm. One of my favorite games of all time is the Battlestar Galactica board game from Fantasy Flight, uh, which is like the humans have a goal, and then the Cylons have a goal, but then in the expansion. They had added in like special Cylons where like they have their where they might they might need the humans to win for them to win, but then they also have to do some other secondary thing too, or they need neither side to win. And I love stuff like that where it's mm-hmm. like I'm, I because it's it's if everybody's just playing okay standard EU for you know get as big as possible, get as many victory cards as possible, whatever. It's too easy to predict what they're going to do. Whereas if you don't know what they're working towards, I think that makes it a lot more interesting. I don't think I know anyone who plays for victory cards or cares about victory cards or a score, to be yeah, honest. I'm, yeah, <laughs> I, I, I never pay attention to it. Uh, yeah, my, I, my I, sort of like rule, yeah, or go ahead. Yeah. I, I feel like the victory cards were basically added for an internal game that they wanted to play years ago and, and I, that was it, basically. And I, made I it think they were work, added, you know. I think they were added by Johan Bad at the hug boxes in the dev clash, honestly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like he wanted to create more incentive for you to break up your hug box. Well, that was, that's always um, the hardest thing about yeah. orchestrating a, a big multiplayer E4 game is, is stopping hug boxes. Right. Um, one good mm-hmm. thing I do I is think like, the... stop anyone who doesn't have a European culture from colonizing, which stops one of the big problems, which is Asian blobs and African blobs. Yeah, just. Ming starting off as the most powerful country in the game and then yeah. just right. snowballing that into just all, all the worse, worse than Ming is is Malaya, uh, who you know, as soon as they get one colonist, they got they got uh, un- uncolonized provinces next to them that have like you know 12 dev yep. or something and really valuable trade goods to boot. So, mm. um, nice spicy islands, yeah, they've got pretty big, good, powerful Which, ideas. Too. That's one thing you have to do with multiplayer though. You have to either make a rule that everyone has to pick a major power or everyone is in small powers Mm. to sort of make it even. Or if you're doing like 50-50, you could do a game where everyone, like someone who's playing Great Britain, 
they're pa- they're partnered with someone playing Ulm or something, you know. Yeah. So yeah. you and maybe their their goal would be, oh, Great Britain has to prosper, but they have to make sure that Ulm takes over the continent or something. <laughs> Yeah, the way we usually did it for the multiplayers that I hosted, used to host um, a couple of years ago was um, the more experienced players in the community. First, I would find the players that were way too try hard and like make sure that they're not on like a Poland or a, yeah, yeah. Uh, a, a Prussia or, or a Brandenburg or something mm-hmm. like that. Um, and then for like the newer players, finding the skilled players that are okay with like babying a smaller country along and creating just rule sets that kind of enable that. I think, I think it's a lot of fun when you, you know, at the end of a session, you have this weird, you know, cold war style, like Alliance block that is ready to explode where everybody starts wheeling and dealing overnight. And then eventually the Alliance block falls apart because somebody managed to like snipe a a country from the other side. And, and yeah, yeah, Mm-hmm. I, I always think that it's. I think that's actually something the Grandest Land did really well, um, preventing the, tr- the the feeling of doing a try hard campaign um, and making it a lot more role play. Uh, yeah, yeah. Like it was just a lot of fun. Uh, an example: uh, as Russia, we actually sent a thousand ducats to the the NPC so that we could rename our voice chat the Winter Palace. <laughs> that was it. We just yeah, we just wanted I remember that. Yeah, we wanted our own nice. our own nice. voice chat to be named the Winter Palace. Yeah, and we yeah. invited people to to come in and, and send their envoys to the Winter Palace. And every other player stopped in at one point and was like, how do we get this? And it was just great. It was a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. One of the better uh, like multiplayer games I played as I was playing as Japan. And um, one one player was like, didn't have much money, so he organized like a raffle. And people were given money and he'd do the royal dice thing. And he was like, okay, we'll just have a lottery, right? So I paid him like, you nice. know, a thousand ducats to rename it from, because I was Japan, to the Plachink, Plachink, Plachinko instead. Oh, rather yes, than the, rather the raffle. Oh. I love it. Yeah, no, that was that was uh, the Stellaris game where I'm playing in right now. One of the uh, uh, one of the players made the Swole Dolphins, and he he made his empire the Empire of Planet Fitness. <laughs> I think at one point I said, "If you send me some energy credit subsidies, I will I will end all of my diplomatic messages from now on with brought to you by Planet Fitness." So, <laughs> brought to you bought, Planet bought the sponsorship rights. Uh, yeah, to my diplomatic course. So yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I, I love stuff like that. I like yeah. yeah so. I don't like yeah. I don't like the if it gets too cutthroat. Like yeah, everybody should stay in the game till the end of the game. That's kind of my philosophy. Like even if you have a bitter rival, it's like all right. Your home state, I'm not going to touch that. You can keep that, and you can keep playing. You know, I think the best board games are generally designed that too, where there's no player elimination. It's just somebody at the end is going to be declared the winner, but everybody can keep playing up to the end. Like the difference between like Risk and Settlers of Catan, I think, is like the classic yeah. dichotomy there, where mm-hmm. uh, you know. Yeah, the rise uh, the rise yeah. on team during the Grandest Land is actually probably the best example is of that. Yeah, they, uh, they the the horse lords uh, yeah, and the yeah. horse memes, which, which, they which essentially put ended up a pretty yeah. damn good fight against you guys, if I remember right. Yeah. Oh, they yeah. definitely did. Yeah, and then eventually we finally equalized relations, and we were finally on good terms. And they essentially were then just sending. Just thousands of troops to help us as our as our Cossack brethren uh, in, in the war against Prussia, and it was great. <laughs> nice. Oh, man. I was dying for them to form Yuan. I really wanted that to happen, but I don't think we. Oh got yeah. The end. Um, <laughs> they were good laugh yeah. actually. Pretty a lot of fun. They, yeah, were, they making... were the most fun for sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think what really messed them up is when they stopped being the horse lord and became what was it, Republic? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Being, uh, was... <laughs> that, yeah. That kind of nerfed them. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. It's always so tough to decide when to stop being a horde. Well, uh, never. They <laughs> they so had cool. to <laughs> they had made an agreement with an a with a someone you know who was playing an AI, hmm. um, a play an NPC play character. I forgot what the agreement was, but they made some sort of agreement that if they got something, that they would, you know, at the right time welcome the 
populist. They had a Habsburg on the throne too, and they turned him into yeah, <laughs> Pres- President Habsburg. I'm fairly certain <laughs> those players were great talking with. As the diplomat, I got to talk with them all the time. Yeah, I'm yeah. fairly certain they were drunk most. Of oh the yeah, time. yeah, I'm pretty <laughs> sure too. As someone who yeah. saw them on stream a couple times, yeah, I'm yeah, pretty yeah, sure. It was it was a ton of fun interacting with them. It was great. They I, were they were so nice. Yeah, that's the other thing because it was like online only. I really hope you know. Stuff like that happens in in the live events, like the in person events, a lot better. Have you been to a live oh, yeah. event at all? No, this was actually this was my first Grandest Land, and I can a hundred percent say that like if if I'm because they do it, they do a little like lottery where everybody signs up, and then they mm. if I'm lucky enough to be uh, selected again, a hundred percent, especially if it's in person. Yeah, yeah. The virtual Grandest Land was so much fun. I can't even imagine being in person and mm-hmm. actually being able yeah, to yeah. talk with people. Yeah. A bit more messy. It's a lot of more cheap Polish <laughs> Polish snaps going around. Um, so. I, 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 do, <laughs> I do think that they should kind of merge them in the future. Like some of the facts, some of the things that were done digitally, such as the. Um, Oh, what, not the proclamations. What were they called? It's you guys. Oh, um, the uh, the packs. Packs. The fact yes. that those would pop up in Discord easily for the stream team for yeah. us to see it. The, the and, propaganda uh, too. I, propaganda <laughs> and the fact oh, that man. it went to the official PDX Discord so everyone could view it very easily. Mm, yeah. When compared to like the uh, in person land, the propaganda is like, "Hey, I made a picture. Hold it up to the screen." <laughs> You know what they should do? I they should like have an oil painting canvas for people to do it, like actual. Uh, yeah. And then the oil packs. Paintings. And then the packs were all like on a whiteboard, and so when the stream team needed to know what was going on on the packs, uh, CK Noor or someone else would have to go run out, take a picture of it, and then bring it back to the stream team. Uh, so yeah, yeah, you know, something merging the two or would probably yeah. be the most like uh, efficient. Pleasant, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, the uh, the propaganda. Actually, um, I, I had streamed the event from from my channel, and I had my. So I know that there was technically one of the players was supposed to be the propagandist, but the way we did it was just my Twitch chat would submit propaganda to my Twitch, uh, my Discord, <laughs> and I would vet it and then copy paste it into the the propaganda. And uh, Kaiutis, who's actually in chat right now, was our. One, I had like a giveaway for the best propagandist, and he he was a hundred percent just crushing it. Um, I got my wrist slapped once because we did one propaganda that was a little too current of any with uh, with oh. Ukraine, but uh, quickly uh, fixed that one. But yeah, the <laughs> the Russia propaganda was was great. Yeah, yeah, there were some really great ones of it. Fantastic. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm hoping that we can have another in person one. Someday. Yeah, hopefully this year. I think it's lost. <laughs> Maybe this wait. year. Mm-hmm. It's possible. Yeah. Um, we will have to see. Play out. Yeah. Uh, where can people go if they want more info on that, though? On the land. land party? Uh, yeah. Like, uh, the, I'm assuming they, there's an archive as well. Oh, yeah. Um, like, so if you is go it on to... Paradox Extra? Or... So it's the. Hold on, I will pull it up. I've been. If you if you launch EU four, it's uh, it's linked on the launcher actually, uh, unless it's. Oh, like that's right. Yeah. Um, but it's on the it's mm-hmm. on the YouTube channel. Paradox strategy. Yeah, it's Long there's a. Whoa. Yeah, Paradox Grandest Land strategy. It's not Paradox Extra. There's like five Paradox. Yeah, YouTube Paradox Grand strategy, <laughs> and there is a playlist. Um, I'm trying to there it is. I will link the playlist in chat. Yep. There we go. It is up to episode twelve, and the beautiful artwork is done by your by uh, our lovely Father Loris here. Yep. And the episodes are edited by Agamaday, also known as Long Game oh, nice. Shorts. Yeah, yeah. And we're aiming for an episode every three days, roughly. Mm-hmm. And it, yeah, it doesn't look like they've announced anything about this year's. Episode. No. So, well, no. it was. It's usually in November, December. Yeah, and I would imagine they're probably like you know trying to decide: is it going to be a physical event this year? Is it? Well, that's the thing you can't really again. can't really yeah. predict it too well. It's like I like think Gamescom is the... like edging. Oh, is it going to be a live Gamescom this year? Live yeah. Gamescom this year, man. Like, oh fuck, it's virtual. Yeah, yeah. So the live or so the the one last year, I think they announced it in like October, because I know it was October when I was approached about possibly casting it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So it'll probably be a while before we hear anything. 
hoping. Mm -hmm. But uh, probably yeah. holding, holding out, hoping. Excellent. Um, so yeah, you can go watch those as they they go up on YouTube. But uh, aside from that, or you can watch the entire. Uh, yeah, I think it's still it twenty four hours Twitch, worth of Twitch bots. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Unedited. Wow. Unedited. Yeah, um, the the, the best. So I'm PST time zone. So for me, I can't remember what the time was, but I think it was. I think we started at midnight my time. Oh time. goodness! Yeah. Oh, wow, <laughs> um, it was like three a.m. here on the East Coast. So yeah, yeah. you wouldn't yeah. even need to really drink. You would just be punchy from. <laughs> Oh, I was so punchy. I, I was just sitting there so overtired and, and sleep schedule so messed up that, yeah. yeah, it was great. I was mostly just, that's why I, I never once touched our country's management. It was entirely <laughs> the other two. All I did was just talk cool. to people and try and convince the the mods to give us the Winter yeah. Palace. Like that nice. was all I did. So, yeah, that's interesting because I also approach uh, Helms Deep about coming onto the podcast as well, and. He said, oh, I would love that, but I actually didn't contribute much to my team. I'm sure our team leader, that. Atlas, would love to talk, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, he's, uh, so Squazzle did all of the actual button clicking, uh, but. Oh, interesting, Realms, okay. Yeah, Realms was there the whole time, like, talking with Squazzle. Yeah, he was, he was backseating in the <laughs> most positive way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, like, and then yeah. we just. Like a rally yeah. driver has the uh, fellow with a map next to him, I guess. That's a yeah. Yeah, it, yeah. It actually for for anybody who ever thinks like the diplomat is boring, um, it's actually the best, right? Because poor Squazzle, who had to like manage the country and keep it alive, yeah, yeah. would like build this massive war chest, and then I would come back from a like a diplomatic meeting, and I'd be like, "All right, we're declaring war on three people," and he'd just be like, "But." <laughs> I just got rid of all of our devastation. And so like I got to just have as much fun as I wanted, just declaring <laughs> wars and building alliances. And then he had to suffer the consequences of every bad decision I made. So it was great. It was yeah. a 10 out of 10. Uh, you'll definitely have to come to a live event then. Cause like in a, in, in the castle, it was funny to see all the, I mean, uh, funny to see all the diplomats wheeling and dealing like in weird nooks and crannies. Like I was just, I went like, yeah, I'm sat at the computer drawing all day, it. basically at the, at the event, and then I was like, okay, I'll, I'll stand up, I'll stretch my legs, explore the castle. I was walking around, and there was an area that was like a spa, and it was closed for winter. I was like, you know what, it's going to be quiet down here. I'll go down there. I was like looking around the corners. I found like two, <laughs> two, two diplomats <laughs> conspiring in this like <laughs> broken down old Polish spa, looking at yep. me like, who are you? What? Who are you playing? How dare you come in here? It's yeah. a private meeting. So like, I'm no, just drawing stuff. I swear. <laughs> I love that aspect of it where it would be like, oh, I saw so and so talking to so and so. They must be ta discussing a secret <laughs> alliance. Yeah, yeah, the like paranoia that, yeah. sitting in there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I totally want, instead of, uh, next time, instead of having, uh, having them have have someone run with their phone and take a picture of the whiteboard, I want them to be able to cut over to like a Charlie from Always Sunny conspiracy <laughs> board yeah. with like yarn connecting board. flags and like just. <laughs> Make him like seem completely unhinged, talking about all the plotting and alliances that are going on. That yeah, would, that, yeah. Would be awesome. that definitely did uh, happen on the online though, because you could see who was in individual voice channels, right? Oh so, yeah, like, yeah. We would, <laughs> like we would see like uh, uh, Poland, who was our ally for the first day. We would see like Poland talking to Georgia, and we would just be like, "Hmm, <laughs> what's what's <laughs> happening over there?" Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that was a lot of fun. Well, I remember there was one country just hung out in Father Loris's chat. Oh yeah, sung high, yeah. Very oh, good laugh. Very good laugh. <laughs> no, no, that was um, that was Livonia. They're the ones that we had to kill because That's they right. yeah, yeah. us at, at the start of the game. That's yeah. right. And we yeah. hopped into Africa, and it was like, oh, we just got to chill now. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, well, other than the grandest land, uh, what kind of uh, stuff do you usually do? Uh, series running right now. Um, yeah, uh, so, uh, right now for EU4, I'm in the middle of an Austria one culture, one tag, um, on very hard. So that's, uh, I took a little bit of break because it, it's so tedious that you kind of burn out between sessions a little bit because one eight hour, six hour session, you advance like 10 years in the game. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And then right now what I'm having most fun with is, is RimWorld. Like I talked about, uh, we're building a, uh, 
uh, we, we're calling it the Holy Thrumbin Empire for anybody who plays RimWorld. The, the Thrumbos are this animal in the game that's uh, like this super big dinosaur With the looking horn, thing. right? That's the yeah, horn yeah. Horn. yeah. So we built a colony that's uh, that's entirely geared on worshipping Thrumbos. And uh, that's just, yeah. <laughs> and we're just building a little little space colony in RimWorld. It's a lot of fun. Hmm. I, I, awesome. I, I got to take this opportunity to evangelicalize uh, Ambonar. I don't know if you've played much of that. Do you ever feel Ambonar, burnt no. out? Oh, it's a fantastic Ambonar. Ambonar is oh, amazing. my word. He hasn't yeah. heard of Ambonar. It's yeah. A, it, okay, you have to look this up. Lambert's it's, not here. It's a, it's a wonderful <laughs> mod for EU4. And if you ever feel a little bit burnt out by EU4 and you need a bit of a refresher, Ambonar. I, I can't play without Ambonar. Lord now, of the Rings <laughs> in its own universe in EU4. Yeah, I yeah. I saw Roomba playing some of that. Yeah, actually, that's that looked like a lot. Where you could have like the dwarves like in their own little like yeah, corridors. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think this dwarf is like a brand new game. Basically, it's more about like digging yeah. your capital and digging your hole deep. Um, yeah, the, I, I'm it? excited for the the Lord of the Rings uh, mods with the the new court system and relic systems for CK3. That yeah, looks yeah. like. When when a fully like supported mod team comes out with a Lord of the Rings version is going to be amazing. Well, the Elder Scrolls well, there is one a Lord is of the Rings. Gorgeous. There is a Lord of the Rings uh, mod for CK three. Yeah, but it's like yeah, a it has I'm, been I'm for a while. Cool. Yeah, I checked I'm, it out a few months ago. It was yeah. really good. That's, hmm. that's it was a preview build. I think we released right. It was not all. Uh, yeah, no, it, <laughs> you could only play as a couple countries. Yeah, yeah. Um, when it's it had some very though, basic stuff, but it was pretty cool. Yeah, I just can't wait because mod teams take a little while because it's so detailed. But once it's once the whole Lord of the Rings world is built, I'd be so excited to play that for yeah, CK3. Yeah, same. I still love the uh, Lord of the Rings medieval two mods. Was if you ever? Uh, oh, that like, was a great a mod. Board, yeah. If you ever played any of that, very good. Back in the day, back in the day, Warcraft 3's Lord of the Rings Risk. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. 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 That's right. I, I yeah. countless hours playing that. Yeah. <laughs> I, I actually had it wasn't a Lord of the Rings one, but I worked on one of the the risk maps for uh, for Warcraft three. Oh, that's awesome. uh, yeah, like went back. I was I was big in the Warcraft three modding community for a little while. I was in a <laughs> Warcraft guild with Ginsu, who he wasn't the original Defense of the Ancients guy, but he was the one after that, and he like went on to work on League of Legends and stuff. Yeah. Oh, oh. Hey, we do have time. Lord uh, Tataris in chat saying the Lord of the Rings mod now has all of Gondor, Mordor, Rohan, and Harid. <laughs> mm. I mean, some really, great. Oh, nice, some really great nice. units. Like um, uh, the character models are great. Yeah. That's awesome. Much, much like yeah. the Elder uh, King. So there's, uh, there's some great previews. We should have a podcast at some point talking about some of the amazing mods that are coming. Uh, Kaiser Egg is updated mm -hmm. just recently. Great. Yeah, I haven't even tried the new Kaiser Egg update either. There's, there's. So, so many, many games mods. to play. I know, yeah, yeah. yeah. So little uh, time. There's more, yeah, and, more on that also next oh, right. two weeks. Oh, three man. Weeks. February is going to be crazy because, yeah, it's <laughs> Royal Court, it's Warhammer 3, yeah. uh, Elden Ring. I'm also super excited for, even though it's not strategy related. But, I am. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, Alice, where can people find you if they want to watch your stuff? Um, yeah, so on Twitch, uh, it's X Atlas underscore GG. Um, sadly, with everything, I can never get the yeah. Atlas handle, so I have to add things to the front right. and back Just in order to get it to work. A random number four on the back of your name. It's what I did. Oh, I tried. <laughs> One through yeah. ten were picked. Oh yeah, there were there were a million. But um, yeah, fucking, I'll, I'll, I'll just copy paste in, in chat to make it a little easier. It's a fucking Greek <laughs> stealing no, your username all the time. Chat right? and your Twitter. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Leanna, what are you up to? Um, I am. I can't say. I could say it's relevant to. <laughs> it's very <laughs> relevant to people who watch this or listen to this show. Um, but I show. can't talk about it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm working on a review uh, for an expansion of a strategy game. <laughs> That's all I'll say. Uh, yeah, looking forward to Warhammer. Three, I got. I think I mentioned last week. I got to do a preview of that, which is uh, which which you can all read on IGN. And um, oh, I've got one question which I forgot to ask. Actually, yeah, there's, there's a lot of previews now. It's uh, the NDA uh -huh. for two of the things, but uh, the way the corruption works now. Yeah. So even some of the YouTube videos I've seen don't seem to understand how this works. Mm. I think legend of total war said the great game just seems to be random. It's yeah. not. Yeah. It's based on 
which god has the most provinces where their type of corruption is dominant yeah. meaning your corruption is higher than any of the other uh god's corruption so you can affect it yeah that's why um, that's why i thought because there's yeah. a few people saying different things about i that. mean that's how it should work at yeah. least uh i'm not sure if maybe it's bugged right now but yeah that's that's how it's supposed to work is you want to make your corruption the highest chaos corruption in all chaos corrupted provinces and then you become the leader in in the great game and like as uh, as like a dedicated yeah, map painter yeah. like um and making things look yeah. pretty that's what i play these strategy games i guess but corruption how does it affect visually on a map because no one seems to have mentioned that it's before i didn't of... play i didn't play long enough to really see if like provinces get really nurgly if you yeah that's the same thing if they get a bit corny yeah yeah, corny. I, I will say I, I like I don't really like the visual style of the Warhammer 3 map compared to Warhammer 2. I liked the little bit more realistic, grounded, gritty look of the map in Warhammer 2. There's some comparison screenshots up on Reddit kind of showing the difference in art style. Yep. If they did it for performance reasons, like that's fair game. I'm totally cool with that. Um, but as a stylistic choice, yeah, uh, I kind of like the Mortal Empires map better. I know. I, 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 yeah, I like the wackiness. I like the over the top wildness. I mean, the wackiness is cool. It just it looks less detailed to me. Like if uh, you look at the ground textures, it looks yeah. Oh, probably so, yeah. Yeah, I haven't had a good chance no. to like obviously zoom into the map too much. So. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, All right. So Father Loris, aside from. Uh, <laughs> Starting new humankind meme things. Oh, yeah, what yeah. What are you up to? I finished a load of stuff for humankind. Was, uh, we did the, I don't nice. know, for a few years ago, we did a sort of uh, meme generator. Um, they're doing a, a uh, load of new stuff, actually. Um, so keep a chance, like, an eye on their social media channels because they've been making loads of cool announcements. Um, they obviously got the expansion, uh, African uh, cultures, um, which is cool. So I've been doing some work for them. I've also been doing thumbnails and just doing bits and bobs here and there. Nice. What about you, Rose? What have you been up to? I have been playing some Humankind, the new African uh, DLC, which is pretty cool, having the new cultures. Which of, the, which of the cultures have you tried out so far? Uh, so far I've gotten up to the Second Age. Okay. <laughs> not, not very far. I restarted a few times. Yeah, um, as you do. Yep. And then on top of that, what else? Um, I've been playing some Going Medieval, because I just did a huge update for that game. Oh. Um, it's still in the desk, experimental patch, hmm. but you can actually change buildings, so you can make your walls, corners rounded now. Oh, um, that's cool. Your floor tiles, you if you're using them as like pathways and stuff, you can put borders on them. Um, oh, all sorts of stuff. And they're oh, they also added seeds and apple orchards, like more trees nice. that you can grow. Yeah, it's a, it's um, a bit then, of a and bees. A bit of a golden age now for city builder slash rim worldy type things. So obviously, yes. get... it really is. Yeah, there's mm -hmm. there's a lot of them. Out the there. fortress stuff, Timberborn. I've really enjoyed. We had an update long ago. Mm -hmm. Waiting for. The thing is, a lot of these things are in early access, and I'm one of these people who plays it when it comes out of early access, and then waits until it's completed. So it'd be like a four-year well, I mean, wait just like carry on playing. There's some things like Prison Architect was in early access for like ten years. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, that was or, one of those. Uh, and she was in the PDX. Yeah, gosh, that was about. Yeah, I mean, that's like fifteen years, I think. <laughs> I yeah, I I got it when it first came out on early access when it was literally just like. I don't know, like forty polygons and like a, <laughs> yeah. like a model that just kind of like waddles while it walks. And yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I I've been meaning to try that because a lot of people have told me I would love it and that it's exactly my type of game. And I just look at it and it's like it looks so bad. But that's also what I said about Crusader Kings too, and it became my yeah. favorite game of all time. Well, Fortress so, is like I don't one know. of my favorite games of all time. So yeah, ass, yeah. So. Well, Dwarf Fortress is getting a UI and coming to Steam. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Probably Soon. sometime in the next 20 years. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> At the rate it's going. Someday. Well, yeah. I believe the project's 
yeah, it's coming on pretty well, but there was some problem with copyrights. I mean, I had to redo a lot of the art assets, so it's probably a bit late. Oh, really? Yeah, I, so. I hadn't heard about that. That makes sense. Yeah. Well, uh, as always, you can follow the podcast for No CB Cast basically everywhere Twitch, Twitter, YouTube. Uh, yep. And I don't think we have an Instagram. <laughs> no. Um, but the VOD, yeah. if you want to catch this later, the VODs are saved on Twitch immediately. And you can catch YouTube 24 hours later, and then Leanna gets it everywhere else in yeah, what, 36, SoundCloud, 48 hours. SoundCloud, <laughs> iTunes, all that stuff generally will be by, by the end of the week, at least. Yeah, by Friday night. So if within 48 hours. Yeah, if I don't get it up on Thursday, it'll be up on Friday. Yeah. So. And, yeah. and I believe links uh, will be in my show notes, right? For Atlas's. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all, all the relevant stuff should be. In the show links wherever you're watching. I forgot to do that on episode 100, but I I will get it back in there. uh, (laughs) 101. Yep. Boom. Uh, yeah, Alice. Thanks for coming on and uh, talking some some E4 with us. It's a great pleasure. uh, First first guests of season two, I guess, as we go for it. Yeah. (laughs) uh, It's been a huge pleasure. Yep, and uh, we'll be back again same time next week. Later, everybody. Bye. Bye.